Welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me, as always, is my lovely co-host, Leg Day Lou. I know you don't see it, but I'm doing my glute squeezes. Nice, good. <laughs> well, um, thanks for joining us on this episode of the Mixing Music Podcast. We're excited to talk about something that's pretty important, I think is uh, pretty crucial to the understanding of the career and workflows of music and the, the life cycles of the, the creation process of music. And that would be um, the proper form for leg day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, is, uh, is the what jobs are for the producer, what jobs are for the engineer when it comes to creative processes, yeah. um, modulation, reverbs, delays, any sort of effects what is the producer's job and what is the engineer's job? And we're speaking in the terms of a producer is someone that helps with the creative process, the writing, even potentially the recording oftentimes they're there to help shape the song. And the reason why we're splitting this up, and this is only uh, pertinent for people that are only mixing. So I know a lot of people that are mixing are also tracking. They're also producing often. Maybe they're even making the beats themselves or whatever it is. Um, that's going to be different. So what we're talking about, and, and you can take away from this, and maybe there's, for people that do every single part of the process, uh, it's a good idea to think um, in this way to help separate, to do better while you're mixing and to, uh, to stay more focused while you're in different phases of a song creation. Um, but let's think about it like this. So I'm going to personally be speaking from the perspective of uh, if you are a mixer and that's all you do. So people send you files for mixing. It's already been produced. It's already been recorded. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that this can translate for people that do every part of the process, the entire song. So this is going to be a useful episode. And we're going to talk um, about what effects uh, are done by who. So in the typical fashion, mm -hmm. Lou, when you're mixing a song... What effects are typically okay to do? Um, As you'll, a mixer, you'll, just you'll mixing. see very statically around just like reverb delay. Um, do a lot of your clients send in their reverbs? Um, do you ask for people to send it in dry? So I ask for both dry and wet. Um, reason being is, uh, and I've always used this as kind of like the, the reasoning when explaining when they have a question about that. Um, I will typically will use your wet stems, meaning that they already have the reverb and the delays already in them. But if there's an issue with it or there's something that I'm trying to bring out, I would actually like to have the dry. Maybe I blend in the dry signal a little bit to like de-wet it a little bit with like some form of parallel process. Um, or um, I'll just try to recreate it as best as I can with the dry and try to move in the direction that I think it needs to to make it a better end result. But at that point, I'm trying to keep true to what they had because a lot of times, like those effects, the producer, the artist already had like a certain sound in mind. And um, one of our interns, uh, Misha, brought this up uh, pretty well last time during one of our uh, uh, studio meetings between the staff uh, when we were asking about like, you know, how to uh, better have sessions with like artists that maybe are new to a studio, new experiences, things of that nature. And she mentioned about how communication wasn't. Uh, her strong suit just yet as far as like what kind of sounds she likes she just kind of like relied on the engineer so there's times where the engineer kind of needs to make these decisions but a lot of times we don't know what the artist really has in mind so if we get the wet stems if they send us like their effects already we have a better chance of hitting the goal but how much i stray from that is usually dependent on like my relationship with the client and what their hopes are so this is interesting um i this is why I specifically ask as much as possible. I prefer wet stems, meaning that mm -hmm. they have EQ as well and yeah. compression settings, whatever they had originally. I prefer that. Um, but as much as possible and in my uh, mix prep guide, mm -hmm. and the reason why you want to do separate sends and auxes for reverbs is because I want the reverbs for the vocals, the room verb, the delays, everything, but I want them in their own tracks. 
mm-hmm, like, like just the reverb. So the, yeah. the vocal doesn't have reverb. It's the aux, which is its own separate track, has reverb. So one of my good buddies, Mike McClellan, whenever he sends me sessions, he's got all of the tracks, which have EQ, compression, whatever, even some modulation or whatever mm-hmm. he decides to use on it. And then all of his reverbs and delays are at the bottom in their own separate tracks, and I can blend them in. I can mm-hmm. EQ them. And I can come because the only problem with having reverb, receiving stems with reverb on the vocals already, is that there's only so much I can do as far as compression goes. Because the more I compress the vocal mm-hmm. with the reverb on it, the more that the reverb comes out, or the more that it starts to fluctuate and modulate, or whatever. So um, <clears throat> that's why, like, you have a lot less flexibility when it comes to mixing with with vocals or with instrumentation that have reverb already. That being said, like a cool. If you have like a drum kit that has a cool room tone or have a room verb and then you mm-hmm. squash the crap out of it, it really brings out that re- room tone. Yeah. That's something you can do on purpose, which sounds fantastic, right? Uh, in some cases. So, um, but typically speaking, um, I'm in the same boat as you. I want those wet stems. Like, mm-hmm. I want your mix. Like, you did most of the work. Why are you being Yeah, why am I restarting? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. on top of that, like, you went in a specific direction. And even if you don't like the direction, if I, if you, like, I've had some clients that have verbalized, hey, I don't like the direction that I went in. Mm-hmm. You can give me creative freedom. Even if they say that, they don't actually mean that. Because yeah. if I change it too much, they're gonna be like, all right, that was a little bit too different. Because, yeah, anyway, it's 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 something a working relationship you have to develop this working relationship to kind of set up expectations, but in in most cases, even if they say they want changes, not that much. Um but anyway, um you give them a direction, you take the direction with wet stems. Uh delays you you said you add delays sometimes, yeah. you add reverb sometimes. Sometimes you got to fill the space if it's a little too empty. There you go. That's right. Uh, sometimes you take away space as yeah. well. Like uh, these are typically- go drier on one thing versus the other. Oh yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. What is something that is typically the move of a producer? Hmm, vocal arrangement and leveling uh, in respects to arrangement what, meaning like chorus. What is dominance chorus. needs to exist? Okay. Yeah. So, for instance, like if I hear a harmony, and I always do. Um, I don't know, uh, Gregorian chants. I might have a lot of low octave, you know, it might just sound like a bunch of hum, 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 right. But, um, the, the funny thing is, is like, if we were going for more like gospel stuff, I might actually push some more upper mid harmonies and stuff like that. You I know? like how the example you gave was no, Gregorian no, no. chants and that was, no. whatever. I, I wanted for the low harmonies. I mean, like, okay, I don't oh, want no, I don't want no, the harmonies no. to sound like a husky. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Um, but you know, the the funny thing is, like, I want to hear your interpretation of how the vocals should be leveled, what takes dominance, where the presence really exists in the chant and the chant in the harmony. Um, reason being is like. I might hear it a little different. And if you just gave me everything unleveled, let's say you just gave me stems and no reference track, it's like, well, I like this harmony stack. I like it blended like this. And I send it back and they're like, that's not how we had our harmonies. It's like, why did you not send me a reference? You know, send me things leveled out the way you kind of heard them. I understand that there's people who like clip gain into their um, uh, gain staging that they like and all that. But a lot of times they'll revert back down to where you gave it to them. Because that's where it was supposed to be. But they might have clip gained it up because a specific unit needs to be hit at a certain level. Cool. But give it to me the way you heard it, the way your mix is. And if you can give me the session and I have all the same plugins as you, even better. Because then I could just edit from the session. But chances are we don't have the same plugins as each other. We are not the same. (laughs) That's true. I I oftentimes get entire Pro Tools sessions Mm -hmm. Um, when people do that. One, if they're affordable plugins, and uh, it's something that I might it. use, I might just get them. I yeah. mean, I charge enough where I could just buy the plugins, right? But um, that being said, uh, oftentimes, like at the very least, I ask for people to print them, yeah. or not print, either commit the, the tracks, send me the committed tracks, or um, freeze them at the very least, yeah. because then I can look at what plugins you use and then unfreeze accordingly. So if there's a track where you use a specific plugin that I don't have, then I don't have to unfreeze it. Yeah. You know, uh, so that's something that's Pro Tools specific. I think the freeze function exists in most other DAWs as well. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So um, uh, Pro Tools is always late to the game, but it's stable, so to speak. I mean, it crashes. <laughs> 
we we like Avid. We like Avid. Yeah, Pro Tools yeah. has has um. Just like any They're company, expensive. they have their. It's expensive, boss, but yeah. it's it works, and uh, yeah, and uh, we like them a lot. And here's the deal: I think that things as well. Like sometimes I'll do like super creative reverbs, yeah, and that kind of blurs the line most of the time. Yeah, um, that's a producer thing. But there's times where, and and I think on the last episode you talked about how you give them two options. Like if I do something yeah. super creative, like a 10 second long reverb tail on one of these songs or one of the words, like. Depending on how obvious it is and how, yeah, how much you might, it changes the vibe. I think that's where the line exists. How how obvious are the changes you've made? Yeah, because like if a song, if they send me stems that are wet, yeah, yeah. and they're really, really reverby, what I'm not gonna do is do a mix where the songs are really dry. Yeah. Or if a song is dry and I'm not going to send it back to them really reverby, what mm-hmm. I'm the reason why I'm adding reverbs is to kind of go along with the idea that they were already doing. Yeah. But it's like, oh, the delay on the end of this phrase would sound cool. And because it's an open, there's no nothing else going on. Yeah. Um, so let's do that. Or like this delay on this guitar would sound cool if it as long as it doesn't change too much, right? Yeah. Um and you're kind of like just doing things that fit the vibe already. You're not yeah. creating new soundscapes. So it's 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 kind of like you're not adding reverb where there's no reverb. Um, although that does happen on a micro level a lot of the times, on individual yeah. track levels all the time. But what you're really doing is kind of like oftentimes replacing the reverb that they had because your reverb sounds better. Yeah. Or like reshaping their own reverb. Yeah. Like that's kind of why I like having the dry stems as an option. Obviously, it's more work. I just tell people like if you can give me the dry stems, you know, I'd love them separately in a separate folder. And the main reason is like, I've had situations where somebody, like, they won't send the reverb as a bus, you know? They'll just send it as, like, on the lead vocal, and it's too much, it's too bright, the sibilance comes through on the reverb and things of that nature. Um, At that point, I might just be rolling off too much top end or too much of, like, that 5K to a point where it's, like, now it's starting to sound weird. It's starting to sound more muffly than it does, like, open. Um, There's, like, things that are just kind of contradicting the work, Right. But honestly speaking, if that's kind of the vibe, I've heard mixes where people shave off all the top end on a lead vocal on its verb and everything. It's just that dark vocal in the mix and it still sounds like a lead. It still sounds like pop. So there's Probably ways because around it's just it. loud enough. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But um, at that point, like you're probably going to start reverbing everything up to make it fit the same space. Yeah. You know, like if the track was really dry, but the vocals were sent to me really, really wet with reverb. It's it's kind of hard to keep the dry the track that dry. At that point, we're making some pretty creative decisions to try to get it to blend. But how obvious are those decisions? They're, that's true. Uh, we're gonna get into like choruses and other modulation effects in just a moment yeah. here. But we're gonna say something. Uh, I've, I'm gonna talk about this real briefly that mm-hmm. I think is really important. The person that sends me the best stems. Okay, we're not so Mike, who I talked about before, Mike McClellan sends mm-hmm. me Pro Tools sessions and yeah. they're fantastic. Yeah. Great, labeled correctly, color coded correctly. Does he have ADHD? Dude, he's fantastic. I think he, we just work together really well. And and that's the sign of like a professional. Professional producer will send stems to a mixer or the next person up mm-hmm. um and it'll be clean. It's it's just yeah. a matter of like it's just experience in the industry. Yeah. Um but the person that sends me the best stems like wave files, not sessions is another producer's name is Gavin McMahon mm-hmm. on Utah. Shout out to Gavin. He will send me a zip folder with a folder of wet stems, mm-hmm. a folder of dry stems, a text file with a, a paragraph or two about the vibe that he likes, the vibes that he's going to, and then a folder of references, including the demo mix and a bunch of references that he talked about in the text file. He'll give Mm. me like exact direction, which is like the best thing ever. He's like the perfect blend of giving me direction as a creative. Mm -hmm. So he allows me to do whatever I do. Yeah. He doesn't even want to know if I'm using his wet stems or his dry stems. He's just like, I don't want to know. Just surprise me. But he gives me enough direction to allow me to be creative. That's good. It's fantastic. And he sends me in one zip file. So I have the wet stems. Mm -hmm. And then if it's like something's not working or I need to blend something in or I just need to replace it completely with their dry stem. I have the dry stems available. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and just expectations that dude, I, I, those are my, and on top of that, each folder with the wet and dry stems has, um, not only this is important, not only are the stems labeled correctly, Mm -hmm. but I love it when producers and artists, they send me files that have numbers on them. 
So it's like uh, they, so it keeps them in sequence. So kick is one, snare is two, so it yeah. automatically imports in sequence. Yep. Dude, it's fantastic to like, well, granted, I always move the bass up because I always work on bass first. Mm -hmm. That's something that I always do. Um, but. And what's funny is I work on bass second. And mine's right after drums. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty typical. Yeah. Uh, but the reason why I do bass first is because I do bass immediately into kick drum. So I get the two low ends mm -hmm. right away. Gotcha. Because instead of doing like the drums and get it to the cymbal and then going back to the low end again. Yeah. So I kind of like right next to each other. But that's, that's something specific, something specific to me. Anyway, um, there's a. a that is, uh, sorry, I'm zoning out here, mm -hmm. but that is fantastic when people like label their sessions correctly. That's like expected. I have a free PDF that you can download on how to mix prep your session, prep your sessions for mixing, um, on links.dkmixes.com. Just go to like free stuff. There's a download, there's a free PDF you can download, um, with my mix prep guide and whenever mm. i have first time clients i email them my pdf of the mix prep guide yeah um which just shows them how i expect stems to be labeled or be bounced or to be whatever so instead of having like if there's like what i don't want <laughs> it's like i don't want all of your lead vocals on 20 different tracks i want your lead vocals oh on one God. maybe two tracks yeah i'm not gonna lie like there's a difference between an ad lib and a lead, and most people get it wrong. And yeah. I and I hate to admit it, but like if you have a lead vocal, chances are there is not another lead. They, they, like there, chances are if you did a harmony, that's labeled it's a, a harmony. harmony. If you did an or ad lib, or like yeah, you might have doubled the line and just put a little more energy in it, but it's supposed to feel like a lead. You could put like ad lib lead or lead ad lib, but like. That's not a lead because then if you have a bunch of tracks like DK said, like twenty different leads, and we had to compile it, we might choose the wrong one. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of people that take the time to do their stems correctly. Okay, so yeah. off of that tangent, let's go back into modulation real quick. Um, I will shamelessly, and I have never been called out for it. No, maybe, maybe once, but I will use general clean chorus effects mm -hmm. all the time in a mix. Mm -hmm. Like, I'll put chorus on things that didn't have chorus on them originally. How shameful. Yeah, no, I, or wideners on it or things of that nature. How dare you? Yeah, I won't, I'll do that without even asking. Nobody's ever brought it up. Yeah, no, normally they Those won't. Those are things. If I do some sort of, like, crazy flanger with a high resonance, like, yeah, lots of, Yeah, they like, might say something. Yeah. yeah, they might, because that changes the actual tone of something. But that's, a mixer, I don't think you should feel bad about using So, widening. I'm actually kind of on the boat of, like, anytime I get anything with, like, heavy autotune, throw a little chorus on it. You like, like that? It, whether it's a lead or not, I think know? it depends for me. But uh, I like it because, well, at least for background a lot of my clients that give me high auto tune speeds, they tend to be more in like that R and B spacey kind of stuff. So like, it just adds to the spacey vibe. Um, like recently, I've been listening to a lot of Chase um, C H X S E, and I really like his vibe. But it's like that. Imagine like. Have you ever listened to like the League of Legends music soundtracks and stuff like that? Like they they feature everybody on it. Like I I really like the JID song that they have. But um, either way, um, I do not. Unfortunately, I do not. Yeah, uh, you should listen to it. It's really high energy music. So whenever you're on your League run, League of Legends, League of Legends, the video game. Yeah, they they sign uh, entire album projects where they hire some of the biggest names in K-pop to feature on their music and everything. Oh, I've and heard like, about this. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, the show Arcane, uh, all their music is from League of Legends because cool. um, that's what it is. But um, either way, point is, like, his music is, like, almost like Tory Lanez-ish meets, like, spacey R&B, high energy kind of stuff. But, like, his vocals are so well affected that I'm like, damn. Like, I really like that vibe. I really like that sound. Um, and so, like, as a mixer, like, if I feel like it can go that route, I'll try to throw, like, those chorusing effects and things like that without asking because I think it's something that, to me, like, part of the reason that you hire an engineer is partly their taste, right? Uh, same reason a, a producer might uh, trust a specific engineer because the producer knows that, hey, I send it to this guy and he amplifies it in a way that we mutually enjoy, you know? So, but if it goes so out of whack, then it stands out, right? 
We're going to take a quick break to let you know that this episode has been brought to you by Tegler Audio based out of Berlin. Tegler makes fantastic analog pieces of equipment, everything from compressors, both tube, VCA as well, from reverbs to recording channel strips to tube summing mixers and to my favorite piece that I personally own and have and use is the Schwarcraft machine, which is digitally controlled compression, 11 different types of compressor. I mean, this thing is built to the brim with tubes and and transformers it's fantastic they have digitally controlled analog gear which i'm a huge huge fan of they've got two different pieces of that they've got 500 series gear so whether you're a tracking engineer a mixing engineer or a mastering engineer you need to check out this high quality company tegler and guess what their prices they're not they're not crazy they're mid-range prices for high-end equipment they're like a fantastic company. We love them so much. And if you want 10% off any of their gear, you can go to their website directly or from their shop directly, or I'll link it in mixingmusicpodcast.com slash Tegler, T-E-G-E-L-E-R, and use the code MMPOD to get 10% off your next order. Now back to the show. The chorusing thing for me is like, I like choruses on leads. I like flanders on backing. Um, and using different forms of modulation to kind of just create a texture, like a front to back depth kind of thing. Like flanger to me always pushes things in the back. Chorus kind of stands out in front a little bit to me, a little more than flanger does. And it helps kind of create like these texture differences in, in the mix, you know? And at that point, I think that's an engineering choice. But I think, well, like I said earlier, once you go past the certain point, once it becomes obvious, it's a producer choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think the job of a mixer one of the things that mixers utilize is width and space left mm -hmm. to right balance as well as spreading or monoing things mm -hmm. of that use use of left and right space yeah another thing of mixers is usually uh top to bottom space which is frequency yeah how much low end how much top end how much mid-range or lack of right yeah those are different things with get, things like guitar. You don't want to change it completely. Yeah. And yeah. lastly, guitar is very easy to change too much. Lastly, a mixer also changes a little bit of that front to back space, like which dynamic is depth. dynamics. Depth. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So that's, what's really important. A, a, what a mixer or what you, as a producer, what you should not be doing in the mixing stage or what a mm -hmm. mixer should not be doing is changing the song. Yeah. For example, when I put chorus on something, what I'm not doing is changing the sound of that thing. What yeah. I'm doing is changing the left to right balance. Yeah. So there, there is a useful, there's a difference there. So I think it's important to note that when you're mixing, um, this is difficult to describe, but I'm going to do my very best here. Mixer does not change the song does not write the song, does not actually change the arrangement, obviously, yeah. never changes the arrangement, yeah. does not mute or add tracks. That's a producing thing. I think it's yeah. pretty obvious. Um, unless you're doing molts and that we're not going to get into that. Yeah. But um, typically does not add instrumentation, does not change the arrangement unless specifically uh, asked to otherwise. And even then, it's, it's not the job of a mixer. The job of the mixer, all they're supposed to do is take the they've specialized in tones and space yep. and front to back, top to bottom, left to right, space and, and um, depth, right and height. And what they do is utilize and maximize the songs front to back depth, top to bottom height, left to right width, mm -hmm. use all of it and make the record shine make the producer sound like they really know what the heck they're doing. Really, really just make amplifying the, the record. Yeah, really making, just making, yeah, amplifying the record or making the producer look good. Yeah. That's your job. And what people, people are confused. I, I want to be careful with how I say this. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to do this at lower levels. More entry level mixing or when you're producing and mixing, um, you're going to change the song a lot. And at that lower level, with lower, uh, with less paying clients, the expectation to it may be to do a lot. The song yeah. sucks right now. Make it better for me. That yeah. might be something. But when you go up the ranks, when you start charging more, when your clients are more experienced, 
the the narrative changes to hey don't fucking touch my mix or yeah. don't f- don't fucking touch anything especially just enhance when you get it. into mastering yeah <laughs> the higher the pay range yeah the even less you are actually required even, not required asked to do even in mixing i mean i've i've heard um this is this is something specific you have to find someone that's actually hired serban guinea or like manny Mayer, whoever but i've heard a before and after of a serban mix in person mm-hmm and it is very, it was super insightful to listen to the A and B. Mm-hmm. Um, Serban Ganea, you should look him up, is the number one mixer in the world. He's also like the most, like he's also the most hidden. He makes a point of not being in the public eye. Um, unlike Manny Mariquin and Jason Joshua, who are more in the public side. Anyway, yeah. uh, Serban, if you listen to his A B mix, mm-hmm. it is surprising how little difference there was. It's like, maybe the kick is a little bit more punchy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, and probably close to like three to $7,000 a mix. Yeah. This dude, definitely within the three to five grand, maybe more per mm-hmm. song, you know, and uh, he doesn't do anything. Yeah. He doesn't, and he's, uh, he's also totally in the box, by the way. <laughs> which is another concept people just cannot fathom or believe. Um, it's really interesting because at that high level, when you're working with people like, who does, like Justin Bieber, right? Because I think mm-hmm. he mixes for Justin Bieber. Yeah. When Justin Bieber's producer and recording engineers who are winning Grammys together, they send you their really polished files. What they don't want Serban Ganea to do Mm-hmm. is basically dishonor them, disrespect their their experience, and totally change the song. Yeah. What he's also doing is honoring them, saying like, hey, you did a good job. I did very little because you didn't do that much. It's And this is why, this is super interesting to me. Mixing is that important. Like that last yeah. step of mixing is so important, even if it changes very little, because the difference between a professional record and a less professional record is typically that last 5 to 10%. Gotcha. I, I, what do you what do you think? Like I mean, like with uh, most things, like the I difference between a good that. studio desk, yeah. and a great studio desk, or like how much it affects your acoustic field. Yeah, like yeah. like it's that last five to ten percent. Yeah. it's not the ninety percent. Yeah, before. like the ninety percent of the desk is like, does it fit the utility you're looking for? But how much of an effect it has in your acoustic field Perfectly is probably the most corner, corners, yeah. nice. Yeah, all that's just accessory. Yeah. Yeah. The the five per, the five percent that really counted is like, yo, this shit made my speakers sound boomy. I don't like it. It's a great looking desk and it fits all the gear and the armrest is nice and cushy, but it makes my room sound like shit. <laughs> or or <laughs> like know? it just feels like shit. Right? Yeah, it's like because uh, I've I I made a post about this the other day and I actually got um very polarizing responses, funny enough. Um and I was really happy with that. Um I put uh, the quality of a gear does not make um, uh, a good engineer, you know, um, and I this ties back into this. This isn't an anti gear thing that I'm, I'm going to bring up, but rather it's it's still relative. But uh, the idea behind this post was like I kept getting asked constantly by usually the same people over and over again, asking the same question, like if you had to choose between this mic or that mic, if you had to choose between this compressor and that compressor, it's like. It's all relative. Like, what are you doing with it? You know, at the end of the day, like you could have worlds of gear and be able to make all these major changes. But as if it doesn't serve the mix, then that piece of gear is pointless and worthless and it has zero value. Um, With that said, you know, we're talking about like, you know, serving Ganea um, essentially making very little to no change, but he does actually do hybrid workflows. Like there was a point where he was all out of the box and there was a point where he was all in the box. And then recently he's been hybrid. Well, with, with um, specifically with Silk Sonic, he went to tape. Yeah, exactly. But that's my point. Like it has to serve a purpose, right? Um, well, some people are like, well, you know, if you don't actually have good gear, why would anybody pay you more and this and that, blah, blah, blah. And I understand that from a very beginner standpoint. A lot of times when an artist is new or they're hiring an engineer for the first time, they want to see the big flashy room. A lot of times when somebody is vetted and knows what they're doing, they know the big flashy gear and they know that like the EQs that people are really searching for are like five, $6,000 a unit, you know? And it's not to say that, you know, your 
standard pre Sonus EQ isn't good. It's just, you know, it doesn't serve the same utility, which is usually the best equipment has no sound. Usually the best equipment does that one thing really well and people use it very subtly, you know? So the idea of like this line, like I said, uh, between the producer and the engineer is how obvious are you being? You know, you can, uh, like I heard, um, people asking me in the past, like, you know, do you use triggers on drums? I'm like, depends. How well was the drum recorded? You know, if I don't have to uh, completely shift the sound of the drum, then no. But if the drum set does not fit the genre that it's in, I either tell you like, hey, do you have any other samples that I can use or anything? And I might use a trigger or something. I might layer it in parallel or something. But a lot of times, like most people don't want you to change too much. If it changes the vibe of the record, then it's too much of a change. So like, it's, it's not even a factor of like, you know, who's got what gear, you know, cause you see a lot of people posting about their gear, their speakers, their this and that. Um, me and you both have Strauss, but we both know that I really, really, now that I've had like time on both the ATCs and the Strauss, I'm still looking at the ATCs. Um, but I still know the difference of like how useful both of them are. And like, it'd be bittersweet the day I lose the Strauss. I'm not going to lie, but it's because each one of them shows me information that the other one doesn't. And the best way I can think of serving the client is by just knowing what information is there, what is necessary, what changes I need to make. And it literally in my personal room, I have no gear. I just have my Strauss, my Hilo, um, which my is computer. an interface. Yeah. And that's it's it. Strauss and ATC are both uh, speaker higher end uh, yeah. and speaker companies. Me and you both know, like with just that, I've still been able to land bigger records and everything and produce for different artists and all that. And it's Well, there's a big trend right now with mastering engineers going all in the box. Yeah, there's there's kind of this returning trend right now. I've been noticing a couple guys like starting to like purchase gear again. But I, I everything's cyclical. Everything the, the, People will buy the gear and then people will go back in the box again. You know, do what you believe is right. If you want to buy gear, buy gear that you like. Forget yeah. forget the trend. But like at the end of the day, like the thing that I've noticed with all these trends, the more expensive you get, the cleaner and the less uh, tonal it is. And the more uh, personal the choice of the gear the more tonal it is because it just has a certain tone or it compresses in a way that like grunges it up a little bit. Like I love distressors. Um, um, I forget what song I was listening to earlier and I wanted to make a reel of it where it's like, uh, every time I wake up, I'm just looking at you. Every time I'm thinking it's about you, every time I'm, just e the distressors. I, the, yeah, it's just me and shots of me and the distressor spinning in circles, holding hands and all that kind of stuff. It's not the most expensive thing I have either. I have the tube tech co one B, but I just like the vibe of the distressor. The but great. you know, the funny thing is the distressor changes the sound so much that I can't use it on every mix. That's true. Um, anyway, going back to the topic here, the difference between a producer and a mixer. Um, this is something that gets complicated a lot. I think that. Again, don't feel bad about changing about changing very little. I think one of the most difficult skills to learn, and we've talked about this many times before, the one of the most difficult skills to learn is knowing when not to do something. Yeah. And oftentimes bad mixes happen because we do too much. And this happens to me personally as well all the time. As many thousands of records that I've mixed throughout the course of my career, there's still times when I accidentally do a little bit too much. Yeah. There's also ways that you can kind of avoid it by taking breaks, whatever, kind of getting back into uh, when you lose objectivity and you kind of try to regain that objectivity again, right? But the point is, mixing is not the stage that you want to change songs. And if you're doing, if you're producing the song, if you're recording the song and you're going into mixing, there's a reason why when tracking engineers mix in the tracking room, mm -hmm. it's called a rough mix. Yeah, there's a difference when when someone that is specialized and they go into a room that they work in all the same time, like a, a proper mixer usually will mix in the same exact room in the same exact position with the same exact spe speakers and equipment uh, across multiple songs because for that consistency. Yep. Um, 
And even if a tracking engineer just does mix it, mix it, every tracking engineer knows that when you dedicate a time for mixing specifically later at a different time, you're going to get a better mix than if you yep. were to just do it all during tracking, which would probably be passable and probably good. Yeah. I'm very proud of my ability to mix while I'm tracking. But if I spend a little bit of time out afterwards, it, of course, it'd be better. Right. Um, that's the most important part. I think a lot of people, a lot of listeners, a lot of people get confused about the differences between the two things. And they're also confused about the expectations of a mixer, the expectations of a producer. Mm -hmm. uh, every pro producing is so wide. Producing can now mean recording. Producing yeah. can now mean just making beats. Producing can now mean arranging strings. What a producer does is very diverse and very specialized in different sections. And you got to find the right producer that's best for your sound that you like. But as far as a mixer goes, um, you shouldn't be like a mixer should not be changing too much and should be very careful about how to please the client. Yeah. And, um, and that's the most part, important part. We make a lot of mixers make a big deal about how this is a service based industry and we can do an entire episode about that. But what does it mean that a mixer is a service industry? That means the client is always right and that I serve them. Yeah. I'm not there to imprint my own sound that happens as a has a side effect. I'm there to please them. So mm -hmm. if they ask me to give them a shitty haircut, I'm going to give them a shitty haircut. I might tell them, that's a shitty haircut. They're like, I know, I still want it. I'm going to give them the haircut that they asked for, right? Going back to that barber metaphor. The point... Um, Mixing is incredibly important, and I'm mm. what I'm not trying to do is downplay the importance of mixing because oftentimes a professional mix is the difference between a record that sounds like it was made at home and a record that sounds like it was funded by a label. And a lot of times that may be hard to hear at first, like not to say that earlier notes to Serban is like saying Serban doesn't do anything. I'm sure there was still a notable difference in like, let's say, clarity between elements, but not so much to where you've revolutionized the mix into something new. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the difference in the serb in the AB test with the servant thing did make it better. Yeah. It was interesting that I couldn't pinpoint exactly why other than the kick drum and maybe a couple other things. I don't remember off the top of my head. But that subtlety but is it worth very thousands. Yeah. I mean, there <laughs> Imagine is, imagine sending in I your mean, a little mix. bit of diminishing returns, right? But a little bit, but think about how many times you get an artist that says, "Oh, it doesn't sound like the rough," and that might actually be very confusing at an early stage in your career. But later in your career, it's like, "Damn, I went too far." That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and I literally have to do a revision of a mix right now. I'm thinking of this top of mind. Uh, this is a rare occasion where I did too much, and they're like, "Go back to the rough." Yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. And that's pretty easy for me to do. So I, I have actually, that's on my mind. I have to do that this week. Anyway, so this does happen to all of us. Uh, and uh, just make sure that you just, you're able to differentiate between the two. So anyway, that's the episode about yeah, the I'll, difference between like producing and mixing. Where the borderlands. Yeah. yeah, where the border, yeah, the border. The borders, the lines, the, the thin lines between the two. Um, and this becomes less of an issue the more experience you get in. So just be aware of it. Some producers want you to do more. Some producers want you to do less. The most important thing is communication. Yeah, I say it all the time. If you can do it at the top of a session or at the top of a project, it makes life way easier. That's exactly right. And on that note, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy.